So thank you all for joining us this evening for our Smilo Shares presentation, celebrating World Lymphedema Day. We appreciate you taking the time to join us this evening and learn more about lymphedema. I'm Heather Studwell. I'm the Oncology Survivorship Coordinator at Smilo Cancer Hospital Care Center in Greenwich. Um, joining me this evening are Dr. Janet Friedman and Dr. Hari Ayala. <clears throat> March is Lymphedema Awareness Month, and it's also today, March 6th, World Lymphedema Day. And although the day is called World Lymphedema Day, it's actually about educating the world on all lymphatic diseases, including primary and secondary lymphedema, lipedema, lymphatic malformations, and the full lymphatic continuum of diseases impacted by the lymphatic system. So this represents a special opportunity for us to spread awareness and educate the world about lymphedema. And in honor of this, we wanted to share with you some updates. So just a few <clears throat> lymphedema facts. Um, lymphedema actually affects an estimated 15% of all cancer survivors and up to 30% of all those treated for breast cancer. The World Health Organization estimates that over 250 million people worldwide have lymphedema. And the NIH estimates, estimates that primary lymphedema could affect as many as one in 300 live births. So I am going to now introduce um, Dr. Janet Friedman. She is a board certified physiatrist at Greenwich Hospital. Her practice focuses on cancer survivorship and lymphedema. She went to the University of Wisconsin Medical School, completed her training in physiatry at New York University Medical Center and residency at the Rusk Institute. Dr. Friedman was trained in lymphedema treatment through the Close Training School. She has been practicing for 35 years and is a certified acupuncturist. Dr. Friedman also served on Hillary Clinton's Healthcare Reform Task Force. So welcome Dr. Friedman and I will have you share your screen. And unmute yourself. <laughs> I'm getting there. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is part of our team over at Greenwich Hospital, myself and our therapists who treat lymphedema. So I'll just describe what the lymphatic system is and basically um, the different types of lymphedema. So the lymphatic system is a fluid circulation system in our body. So the heart, as you know, pumps the blood, it goes out through the arteries to the capillaries, and then to the veins back to the heart. So it's a circular system. When the blood is going out to our whole body, to our tissues, about 10% of it spills out into the tissues to bring oxygen and nutrition and hormones, etc. And this has to return to the heart and it returns through the lymph system or the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system has its own separate vessels, similar to the veins, a little bit different. It travels from where it exists in the arms, the legs, the head and neck, back through the body, through these lymph vessels and passes through the lymph nodes and the lymph nodes filter the fluid. So when you get a swollen glands, as people call it in your neck, from a sore throat, a virus, those are lymph nodes and they're filters of the lymph system. White blood cells are in the lymph nodes, sort of analyzing that fluid and they'll alert the body to send more white blood cells to the area. The fluid itself is part of the lymph system and other organs such as tonsils, et cetera. So here's just sort of a picture of the body and the the lymph vessels. So they start out in the arms, legs, head, and neck, and all that fluid goes towards the center through the lymph vessels, which here are the little thin green lines, to the lymph nodes, which are circled here. The lymph nodes tend to cluster in parts of the body, the neck, the armpit, 
the groin. We also have lymph nodes all through our trunk and in other areas. And this is just another picture of the similar type of thing. So we have cervical lymph nodes in the neck, what are called axillary lymph nodes in the armpit, inguinal lymph nodes in the groin area. So for people who are having breast cancer treatment, axillary lymph nodes, lymph nodes in the armpit will be removed and looked at under the microscope by the pathologist to see if there are any breast cancer cells there. And that will determine whether the breast cancer has started to spread through the body and will determine partly what type of treatment is needed. <clears throat> Excuse me. The inguinal lymph nodes, these are at the very top of your thigh. They may be, some of them may be removed, for example, for a melanoma in the leg or cervical or uterine cancer, um, et cetera. So when these lymph nodes are removed, think of this as a traffic flow problem. We're still making lymph fluid. That 10% of fluid is always being made day in and day night and night. And it has to pass back through the lymph vessels and the lymph nodes to get back into the heart circulation. And if some lymph nodes are removed, you can have a backup of that fluid into the arm, if it's the axillary nodes, into the leg, if it's the inguinal nodes, into the head and neck, if it's the nodes from the neck. And this is what we call lymphedema. Edema is really the term we use for fluid in the body where we don't want it to be. And lymphedema is from a problem of the lymph system not being able to carry the amount of lymph fluid it should be carrying. And the result then is what we call lymphedema. And as Heather mentioned, there are 250 million people worldwide with lymphedema. In the United States, the majority, overwhelming majority of people with lymphedema have it as a result of cancer surgery, removing some lymph nodes. And the majority of those people are people who have been treated for breast cancer. In the world, the major cause of lymphedema is actually parasite invading the lymphatic system and clogging it up. And um, this will then also cause a similar lymphedema problem. So lymphedema, as I said, it's an inability of the lymphatic system to handle the fluid load. Now this can be due to a damage to the structure of the system, as I just talked about, surgery removing lymph nodes, significant trauma, um, burns, et cetera, can also damage parts of the lymph system and people will get lymphedema downstream from that, but it also can be an overload of fluid. So for example, when the body is pumping that blood all throughout the system and the veins need to carry 90% of it back, if you have problems with your vein functioning, that um, blood will not be able to return efficiently through the veins, and you can get a backup of fluid back into the tissue. And then it's really the lymph system's job to try to manage that overload, which it can do to a degree, but if it's a severe amount, you will get also swelling from the venous system. So many people will be told they have something called venous insufficiency, which is usually a swelling in the legs, because their veins are not working but it's the lymph system that needs to pick up that load. And if you have that backlog of fluid, we would call that lymphedema also. Now, the fluid of lymphedema is very specific in that the lymph system carries proteins and proteins are big, big molecules. I like to tell patients, just think of this as a highway and you've got the truck lanes with the big trucks that move slowly lumbering along and you have the other lanes with the cars, they're the, they're the veins, they're traveling faster, going smoothly, the truck lane is going slower. And when you have lymphedema, those trucks can't even get into the road. They're stuck out in the neighborhood. So they're clogging everything up and they're hard to move. So that is um, what then causes changes in your body for a long term. So lymphedema, in the very beginning, you have some swelling, you may lie down at night and it clears out. Over a period of years, it will get harder and harder to clear out because this protein, these trucks are sort of stuck in the neighborhoods in your legs or your arms and they hold on to fluid and make it harder for that fluid to move out. And you go into a further advanced stage of lymphedema where your skin may become thicker. You may be more susceptible to wounds and 
um, infection. So this is just a simple picture of lymphedema of the arm. So obviously we can see that the arm is swollen. And when we see um, this type of thing and compare it to the so-called normal arm, you see, you can't see the veins, you can't see the tendons, you can't see skin wrinkles. We always say in lymphedema, we like wrinkles because if the skin is wrinkled, it's not really full of fluid. So this arm has had, has lymphedema, most likely from lymph node removal that we will then be treating, which Heather will talk to about in a bit. Now, one of the major problems of lymphedema is what's called cellulitis. So in addition to an arm being swollen, feel a little heavy or a leg swollen, a little heavy, maybe have difficulty fitting into shoes, fitting into clothing, putting rings on and off, you're susceptible to get an infection called cellulitis. Now, cellulitis is common in many people, but people infection where bacteria has entered the body and infects the skin and the layers of tissue underneath the skin. It can be from a cut, from a wound, from a burn, from a bug bite. Bacteria has been allowed to come into the skin, through the skin, and come inside. Now, the body's normal reaction is to send those white blood cells there to chew up the bacteria so the infection doesn't spread. But they're alerted because the lymph fluid flows through the lymph system and notifies them. If that lymph fluid is not moving or is moving very slowly, the bacteria in your body can grow and multiply and give you a much more serious infection, which we call cellulitis. You know, bacteria love to be inside because it's warm, it's wet, there's sugar in our blood and they can grow and multiply to give cellulitis and if it spreads through the body, even sepsis. So this is one of the reasons we really want to treat lymphedema and keep it reduced to prevent cellulitis. And if you have lymphedema and come for treatment, you're taught skin care to try to protect your skin from these infections. So I want to talk a little bit about risk factors for lymphedema. We've mentioned lymph node removal, but what is really the risk for having lymph nodes removed? We have many lymph nodes in our body, many, many lymph nodes, and the numbers that are being removed will be part of your risk for developing lymphedema or not if you've had that type of surgery. So we know from studies, this is mostly referring now to breast cancer treatment, if you've had six or fewer lymph nodes removed, you have a 5% five-year risk of developing lymphedema. This sounds small, but 5% is actually a pretty big number for a side effect. So we want to be very careful to monitor people for this development. Radiation increases the risk up to 8 to 15%, depending on where the radiation is, um, how your own body reacts to it. Being overweight is also a risk factor for lymphedema. So people who have a body mass index over 25 have an increased risk for having lymphedema. If you had a post-operative seroma or cellulitis or hematoma, you're also at a greater risk for developing lymphedema. Now, this is not really, I'll explain what these things are. It's not really because these cause lymphedema, but they're an indication that your lymph system is not healing well in the area of surgery. We talked about cellulitis. A seroma is a little collection, a little sort of bubble of lymph fluid. So think of these lymph nodes being removed and lymph vessels are supposed to be draining into them, but now they have nowhere to go. So they're dripping and they collect some of that lymph fluid before they heal up. And hematoma is a collection of, of blood indicating that you're not healing after the surgery as quickly as we would like and you have a blood collection. So these are just indicators that someone is at a little higher risk. Now, um, the only real behavior that has ever actually been proven to increase your risk of lymphedema are hot tubs. So there's something about submerging in that total heat for long periods of time. Your own bathtub is fine. It doesn't keep pumping hot water in, but hot tubs, use of hot tubs increases your risk of lymphedema. That's not always good news when I tell patients <laughs> this. And then some other features of treatment, such as certain chemotherapies, and having had lymph node surgery or radiation on the other side may increase your risk, but we don't really have strong data on that. So I like to call this the falsely accused for many years. If many of you have gone 
you know, on Dr. Google and looked at what can I do to prevent lymphedema, you'll see a long list of, of things that really have been disproven. So air travel is safe. If you're at risk for lymphedema, it will not cause it in the arm. Um, we know that many people get swelling in the leg anyway. So we do recommend our patients if they've had lymph node surgery in the legs to wear compression stockings on the, on the legs. Now, if you already have lymphedema, we do recommend compression garments for the arms as well. Having a blood test of venipuncture, having blood pressure, having an IV in an arm that had had lymph nodes removed and does not have lymphedema will not cause it. Exercise, we encourage, and some exercise may actually reduce lymphedema because of deep breathing, because of moving your muscles, move fluid in. Carrying shoulder bags will not increase the risk of lymphedema or make your lymphedema worse. And having an elective surgery on the limb that is at risk or has lymphedema won't increase it. You really need to take care of your body and do the surgery that you might need for other reasons. I quickly want to go over what is um, this item called the LDEX. So if you have had lymph nodes removed for breast cancer and do not have lymphedema, we now have a way of measuring the fluid in your arm to catch a very early beginning of lymphedema, and it's called the LDEX. You stand on this machine and put your hands on the top of it, and it measures what's called your interstitial fluid. That's the fluid in the body that's not traveling through the blood or lymph system, sort of, you know, our, the fluid in our flesh. And we do a baseline before you have surgery because everyone's measurement is a little different. And then we follow you for five years on a very close basis. And we know that from studies done here, if we catch a very early change in the amount of fluid in your arm and treat you, we can reverse lymphedema so it won't come back. If we wait until we can see it, you can feel it, we cannot reverse it to have it have it go away. We can we can um, take care of it and maintain it and reduce it, but not reverse it. So we get a little chart that looks like this, and um, the black line are the measurements this particular patient had, and she has stayed very nicely for three two and a half to three years in the green zone, which is normal. If she went up to that yellow, that's when we would need to intervene to bring her back to the green and the red would be actual lymphedema. So this charts in backwards, but this is an example of such a, a, a setting. So the first measurement um, was normal, her preoperative measurement, but the second one went into the yellow. You couldn't see the lymphedema or measure it any other way, but think of this as a pre-diabetes, as a warning sign of a pre-lymphedema. We then treated her, in this case, she just really needs to wear a compression sleeve for about a month, she returned to normal. So if you have had or planning to have um, surgery to remove lymph nodes, this is a very helpful device now for us to, um, to monitor for the development of lymphedema. Okay, that's what I had wanted to say today. So I'm gonna introduce our next speaker, who is Heather who introduced herself a bit. So Heather received her bachelor's of science degree in child and family studies and education from Syracuse University. And she's often wearing orange, a master's degree in occupational therapy from Mercy College. And in 2022, she completed her MBA in healthcare administration from Marist College. She's been a practicing occupational therapist at Greenwich Hospital for over 23 years. And she's a board certified lymphedema therapist and oncology rehabilitation specialist. And she's currently pursuing a doctoral degree at George Washington University. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so I'm going to share my screen again. And just um, because my housekeeping slide didn't pop up earlier, um, just to remind everybody that we will um, take all of our questions at the end um, of our um, webinar and you can put them into the Q&A and the chat feature. Um, so let me just get my slides back up here again. And I'm going to talk about <clears throat> treatment of lymphedema. Um, there are many treatment approaches to lymphedema, um, none of which unfortunately offer a cure for lymphedema. 
complete decongestive therapy or CDT, um, which is the standard of care for patients with lymphedema now, um, consists of four components of treatment that are necessary for the, the CDT to be effective treatment for lymphedema. Um, the first is manual lymphatic drainage. So MLD um, is a very gentle massage technique that improves the function of the lymphatic system and reroutes lymph flow around blocked areas and into healthy lymph vessels, which drain into the venous circulation. Um, the second part of therapy is compression therapy, which is special multi-layered compression bandages that are applied to increase tissue pressure and improve <clears throat> the efficiency of the muscle and joint pumping. So this helps to prevent reaccumulation of evacuated fluid between manual lymphatic drainage treatments. Once a patient's limb is sufficiently decongested through repeated treatments, we can fit them with a compression garment. Exercise is also part of CDT. Exercises are performed with compression bandages in place to activate the muscle pump of the affected extremity. This results in an increase in the lymphokinetic activity and further reduction of the swollen limb over time. And the last part of CDT is skin care. So as Dr. Friedman mentioned, cellulitis can be very common, uh, a very common complication of lymphedema. So meticulous skin and nail care and just general good hygiene are essential to eliminate bacterial and fungal growth during and after treatment. <clears throat> so CDT um, is a two-phase therapy. So phase one is when you come into the clinic. Therapy starts with an intensive decongestive treatment consisting of MLD and compression bandaging it's administered by a therapist, usually a PT or an OT, who've been trained in lymphedema therapy. During this phase, the patient is educated in skin care and exercises, taught how to self-administer manual lymphatic drainage and apply compression bandages or garments. <clears throat> the intensive phase is followed by a self-care phase during which the patient takes control of their own care. So maintaining the daily regimen of care is very challenging for patients. We know this. Um, Non-compliance is very common. So it's important that patients have regular follow-up visits with their provider to help keep them on track. So typically we will have a new patient come in, go through phase one, set them up for phase two, and have them come back every six months for sometimes what we call a tune-up, sometimes just to check that their compression garments are still fitting well or still effective. Um, but CDT can be very effective and successful because of this interplay of the two phases between decongestive phase and the self-care phase of treatment. And our goals of lymphedema therapy um, are to educate the patient about lymphedema and infection prevention and also risk reduction practices. We want to reduce the limb volume and fibrosis or scar tissue. We want to restore functional mobility and range of motion, improve cosmesis, cosmetic appearance, and sense of well being in the patients. Also, to improve quality of life. So, patients must be encouraged to be as independent as possible in the daily management of their lymphedema based on their functional and psychological abilities. I'm gonna show you a video now of what manual lymphatic drainage looks like. Um, so here on the right side of the screen is a diagram of a patient who has left upper extremity lymphedema. You'll see the swollen, swollen limb here and the arrows are the directions that we reroute that lymphatic fluid too. So you'll see on the screen. I'm going to interrupt you for one second. I don't think we can see your video. Oh no. How sad. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh. I don't know how to make you see my video. Maybe the, if you try to share your screen one more time. Okay. Hang on. The narration is, is excellent though. Thanks. <laughs> um, 
All right, let me end the slideshow. Sorry about that. Let's start it again. Yes, we can see your PowerPoint. Okay. Now. So if I put it I into it. Yep. slideshow mode, yep. Player mode now? Mm hmm. Oops. Yes, definitely working. Okay. Hopefully, when the video comes on, it'll work. Still going? All right. Yep. Here we go. Good. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, so this is what manual lymphatic drainage would look like on somebody who had left upper extremity lymphedema. It's a very gentle um, massage technique where you're not putting a lot of pressure on the patient. Um, it's very slow um, and methodical, essentially. Um, as you'll see, once the video changes, we're, <clears throat> we're gonna place the patient into different positions so that we can get all aspects of the lymphatic vessels that cross over um, from one, the affected side to the unaffected side. So we're gonna use the lymph nodes that are in the opposite armpit. We're gonna use the lymph nodes that are down alongside of the um, inguinal area to help draw some of that fluid and take up some of that fluid as we redirect it out of the limb. And let's hopefully the next video will work. MLD alone though is not the treatment for lymphedema. <clears throat> you guys still seeing this? Okay. So we also add in that second part of the treatment, which is multi-layered bandaging. So compression bandages are applied after every treatment of manual lymphatic drainage. Um, depending on the infected area, this may include fingers, toes. Um, if somebody's had head and neck cancer, we might um, have a, a bandaging you know, around their chin or their cheeks. Um, as you can see in the photo on the left, this is somebody who has breast edema. We have lots of different tools and techniques for managing where the swelling is. But <clears throat> The bandages re will remain in place, so we'll wrap this, this patient, and then they'll come back the next day, we'll remove them, and we repeat the session all over again. We use, um, you'll see that we're adding some foam inserts here. So the foam is used for a couple of reasons. Um, sometimes over time, we can have skin changes or the, a thickening in the soft tissue, and we need to add a little extra compression in there to help break down some of that fibrotic tissue um, that can happen uh, in the soft tissue area. So the foam helps us to keep a good um, gradient pressure as we wrap with the bandages. And then it also helps to break down some of that thicker fibrotic tissue that can happen in the later stages of um, lymphedema. Um, it's also important to note that these are not ACE bandages. Um, these are bandages that are low stretch bandages. So they only have a little bit of give in them, whereas an ACE bandage you could stretch really far out. Um, and we're not putting any pull or pressure on these bandages. We're not pulling them really tight to, to squeeze the arm. It's as if you were to lay on your bed and put a blanket on top and then another blanket and another blanket and another blanket. That layered effect is creating a pressure and your muscles are on the other side of that. And so from the pressure of the, the top layer of bandages to your muscles pumping, that helps to facilitate <clears throat> that continued flow after we've done the massage therapy. But compression alone is not the treatment for lymphedema we have to add in all of the elements of CDT for it to really be effective lymphedema treatment. So once we're done with that first phase, we'll fit patients and the limb is decongested, we'll then fit them for compression garments. And that's a, a whole nother lecture in and of itself, but there's a variety of types of garments um, 
there's for every body part that could possibly have swelling. Um, there are garments that are made off the shelf where we can just pick a size. Many garments are custom made um, for patients. There's garments for daytime, for nighttime, um, but garments are meant in this case, these garments that I'm showing you now, these garments are meant for the latter state after your decongestion is done. This is gonna hold you so that lymph doesn't fill up again in the limb once you're done with the first phase of treatment. There are garments for breast edema as well. Um, this is a, a very common nighttime garment that we might get for somebody who has breast edema. Um, sometimes we'll have foam inserts and foam pads that we'll place under the arm um, against the breast or in the genital region. Um, and, you know, as I said, this is a head and neck garment. Um, this, these are nighttime garments. And then there are also garments that have Velcro closures, which make it easier to put them on. Sometimes these compression garments are hard to put on. So we have to um, accommodate for the patient's physical abilities. Um, you know, sometimes they're too hard. They, they can't pull them up or get them on. So we have garments that are meant, made with Velcro to make it easier to put them on. And nowadays garments come in many different colors and patterns and you know, gone are the really boring, basic, plain beige garments. Um, as Dr. Friedman mentioned earlier, the importance of proper hygiene um, is very important part of tr lymphedema treatment. So cleaning after every bandage or garment change is really important. Getting in between your toes and your fingers, making sure that you dry in those areas is very important. Um, applying moisturizer before you put on a garment, um, allowing it to really get absorbed into the skin and keep that skin hydrated is very important. And we also want to oops, um, avoid infections, which Dr. Friedman already talked about in terms of cellulitis. Um, you know, lymphedema can lead to a breakdown in the skin. So these types of infections can be um, very common um, in our patient population. So what happens when a patient has cellulitis um, for CDT, we stop that immediately. Um, it's not advised to treat patients with CDT um, until they've been seen by a physician. Often it's a therapist who will recognize cellulitis in a patient. Um, we'll send the patient immediately to their physician or um, to the emergency room if it's after hours so that they can get started on antibiotic treatment right away. So we hold off on treatment. Um, we wait until the patient is seen by a doctor. We wait until they've started antibiotics. And once they've been on the antibiotics for a while and those acute symptoms have gone down, then we can start and resume treatment again. And usually that's somewhere between five and 10 days. So exercise is also um, a very important part of the treatment. Um, a comprehensive exercise program for lymphedema should always be included in that treatment plan, which includes that deep diaphragmatic breathing, active range of motion, strengthening, and stretching exercises. Um, there have been two semi-recent papers about weightlifting for patients at risk for lymphedema and patients with breast cancer-related lymphedema that have shown that weightlifting is safe um, for both of those populations of patients if they've started that in a supervised and controlled manner. So it doesn't mean just go out and start lifting weights. We want you to do it in a very controlled manner. And there are exercise programs out there that are done in a controlled manner. We have one um, at Greenwich Hospital. We have the Strength After Breast Cancer Program, which we adopted from the UPenn study that came out. Um, you get an evaluation and four sessions with one of the therapists to learn the protocol and you carry out the program at home. It's two to three times a week. And then you return intermittently every week, every second week, it depends on the patient to progress or correct any problems that you have with the program. So this is just one um, sample of an idea for 
um, a supervised exercise program that does help um, reduce patient, reduce lymphedema in patients who have it and does not put a patient more at risk for somebody who's had a lymph node dissection. And so effective CDT requires that the patients be seen five days out of the work week. So every day of the work week for at least two weeks. Um, treating patients two times a week with CDT um, does not result in adequate decongested, decongestion of an affected extremity. Um, the patient will end up being seen for more sessions over a much longer span of time, yet, and they'll also have less decongestion in that time than if they were treated more intensely. So treating a patient for only one to two times a week with MLD and bandaging is not the phase one CDT. So you'll see here, this shows an example. Sometimes we have to see a patient for three weeks every day or four weeks. It really depends on the size of the limb and how many body parts are affected. Um, but then we can taper them down while we're waiting for their garments to come. Once they've decongested, we can go to three times a week or two times a week. <clears throat> if we look at an ineffective CDT phase and we look at these next to each other, we're seeing if somebody comes in twice a week, they actually end up being seen for more visits than if they were to come every day and then taper down while we're waiting for the garments um, and they get less effective treatment. Um, a lymphedema therapist <clears throat> should be um, a licensed health professional, obviously. They should be certified in lymphedema treatment which means they should have completed a course that's 135 plus hours of specialized education. You'll know that they've completed that course because their identification will be that they're a CLT, not to be mistaken for CDT. Um, so they are a certified lymphedema therapist and there now is a specialized exam, a board certification exam for CLTs to take um, after they've completed their coursework, um, which um, is not required for them to do so, but that actually may change in the future. Um, so as with any other professional, completion of a lymphedema therapy education program doesn't guarantee that the therapist will be effective. Some therapists will be better than others. Um, if a patient doesn't see the progress or a therapist isn't practicing in a manner outlined earlier, um, the daily treatment in the first phase of treatment, um, the patient could possibly seek out more effective lymphedema treatment someplace else. Um, you know, when we see people come back so that that first phase of treatment, that intense phase of treatment, daily treatment is for a patient who's never been treated before. Um, we might see a patient who has a mild swelling in the arm or an at-risk patient who just maybe went into that yellow zone on the LDEX that Dr. Friedman showed earlier. There are cases where we change that intensive daily phase, but for somebody who has visible swelling and it's the first time they've ever been treated, we would do that. The standard of care is that five days a week for at least two weeks. Um, when they come back, they come back in six months. Sometimes we only have to see them for three days. If they've been managing on their own, and they don't have a lot of increase in swelling again, um, then we might only have to see them for three days in a row. That, that all gets to be independent, but that very first time, it's really important um, to have that effective therapy treatment. <clears throat> so patients need to check the credentials and the experience of the therapist that they're being treated by. Um, we really need patients to kick the tires of their lymphedema programs and ask questions. You know, what does is, what is your lymphedema program consist of? Um, we really want you to get that quality therapy that's available out there. And just to show you <clears throat> what good treatment can look like, um, this is a patient, 72 year old female. She has um, an 11 year history of breast cancer. She was treated with a mastectomy and radiation on the left side. So you'll see her swollen limb here. 
um, and after four weeks of CDT, um, she was transitioned into her self-care protocol, which meant she got a class one garment. Class one is the, that indicates how much pressure is exerted by the garment. Um, and then we taught her how to self bandage and she is able to maintain this volume loss in her arm. And this is another secondary lymphedema patient after cancer surgery before and after four weeks of intensive treatment. Now we talk a lot about breast cancer related lymphedema, but this is a patient who has primary lymphedema of the lower extremities. And after four weeks of intensive therapy, so four weeks every day, this are the results of his legs. And then he was fitted with compression garments as well. Um, just to mention diuretics. Um, so sometimes diuretics are prescribed for swelling um, and it may or may not be the most effective thing. It may help in early stage or malignant lymphedema, but not recommended for treatment of your uncomplicated lymphedema. Um, typically routine use probably won't, um, what it does is it, it draws the, the water out of the simple fluid out, but it leaves the protein that's in lymph fluid, um, which doesn't respond to that diuretic. We do have patients who are on diuretics if they have a comorbid condition. So if they have congestive heart failure or hypertension or they're in palliative care, we obviously continue to have them take the diuretics that they need for other medical conditions. But if they're taking it just specifically for their lymphedema, it won't necessarily make it go away. Um, and long-term use may actually make that lymphedema more resistant to therapy because you're gonna get that thicker indurated tissue. And pumps. So pumps are um, equipped with, um, it's an equipment piece that will provide a gradient sequential slow pumping action that will stimulate lymph flow. So some physicians uh, without understanding what treatment is out there, what treatment can do for a patient may prescribe pumps rather than complete decongestive therapy, um, but pumps don't take the place of complete decongestive therapy. They're very appropriate for the self-care phase, um, but they're rarely effective as first treatment or as a standalone treatment for lymphedema. Um, we do recommend sometimes for patients who, um, for a number of reasons, use it in their self-care phase, um, but they shouldn't be prescribed just because the insurance is covering the device. And typically they do cover the device. The device. Um, so you'll see there are pumps that have trunk um, pieces that you put on to decongest your trunk before you decongest your limb. And then we have just a device without a trunk application as well. And so um, we talked a little bit earlier about, we've talked about the treatments for lymphedema for patients who actually have lymphedema. And I'm just gonna quickly touch on um, what's available for our at-risk patient population, which Dr. Friedman talked about a little bit earlier with the LDEX machine and she showed you the graphs. Um, and particularly this is used right now for breast cancer related lymphedema. Um, so can breast cancer related lymphedema be prevented? Um, well, there's lots of emerging research and evidence-based practice that suggests yes, um, through prevent, uh, prospective surveillance and symptom reporting. So a preventive, a preventive prospective surveillance program um, is very important and based on patient education, early recognition of signs and symptoms, and the ability to apply early intervention. So much like detecting any cancer early, if we can detect lymphedema symptoms early, we have a better success at preventing or controlling that progression of swelling. And several studies have confirmed the benefit of prospective surveillance in reducing the physical and psychological impacts on patients including a lower risk of developing breast cancer related lymphedema 
after treatments. And so the data does suggest that with that early intervention, we can prevent the progression. Um, and for that subclinical stage, that stage where we were in the yellow on that graph earlier, stage zero, um, that it doesn't progress any further than that. And we can actually control it and put them back into the green um, where they would be considered to have a normal, normal limb volume. So at Greenwich, we have our lymphedema surveillance program um, for patients diagnosed with or being treated for breast cancer. So this means that the patients are seen preoperatively and we get a baseline screening measurement um, of their affected extremities or soon to be affected extremities. Um, we do a functional assessment and we educate the patient. Um, we also then monitor them throughout their continuum of cancer care. We'll see them a month after their surgery. Um, repeat the volume measurement. We will then check their range of motion um, and look for any symptom changes that might affect the upper extremity. We're also able to monitor them um, for side effects from their cancer treatments. Um, they're given individualized education exercise programs at that point. And if we see a change, then we start that treatment early and potentially stop the progression of it. So that risk of triggering lymphedema um, in that at-risk population is never zero. Therefore, our patients should be empowered with education about their relative risk for developing lymphedema. Early intervention is not a one-time need to prevent breast cancer-related lymphedema. Um, it must be part of the longitudinal continuum of breast cancer care and treatment. Um, there's so much more to be known about who's at risk for breast cancer-related lymphedema, how to manage it, so stay tuned. These are all um, studies that are emerging as we speak. <laughs> and that is all I have on treatment. So I am now going to um, go through to the end here. And I would like to introduce Dr. Ayala, who will talk to us about updates in surgical interventions for lymph lymphedema. So Dr. Ayala is an assistant professor of plastic and reconstructive surgery in the Department of Surgery and cares for patients as part of the Center for Breast Cancer at Smilo Cancer Hospital and Yale Cancer Center. She graduated Alpha Omega Alpha from the George Washington University School of Medicine and completed her residency in plastic surgery at Rutgers followed by a fellowship in reconstructive microsurgery at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Dr. Ayala's clinical interests include post-oncologic reconstruction, say that three times fast, focusing on microsurgical techniques. She's an expert in autologous, deep flap reconstruction, pap flap, dug flaps, all those flap reconstructions, and also specializes in direct to implant breast reconstruction. Dr. Ayala is also one of the few surgeons in the Northeast that performs immediate lymphatic reconstruction at the time of axillary node dissection and offers lymphovenous bypass and vascularized lymph node transplant procedures. Her research interests include robotic microsurgery, evaluation of outcomes after complex reconstruction, innovation in microsurgery, and operative efficiency. She has authored over 50 peer-reviewed publications served on multiple national committees and is committed to mentorship mentorship in surgical education. So I will stop sharing my screen and welcome Dr. Ayala. Oh, thank you, that was a very nice introduction. <laughs> me. I feel like you covered most of what I was gonna talk about in my talk. Okay, so let's see if I can get this to work. Can you guys see this? Start at the beginning. This is working. You can see my slides. Okay. Yep, you're good. Okay. I just can't see any of you. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thanks again. It's great to be here. Um, and I will say that it's hard to follow those talks because obviously the mainstay of lymphedema treatment and therapy is really completely congestive therapy. And that is the take home message of tonight. Um, but we're going to talk about a couple of other treatments that we're exploring and, and hopefully will um, become more evidence-based and, and we'll have 
again, not a cure, unfortunately, which I think someone has already asked in the Q&A we'll get to, uh, is there a curative treatment, but we are on our way. So right now, of course, we covered comprehensively and really wonderfully that current treatment is really, it's considered a palliative approach. We've already have lymphedema. And so we are, I won't go through this again because, you know, Heather did such a fantastic job, but um, after complete decongestive therapy, it's just some patients are like, okay, I'm doing this, but now what? You know, this is a approach that is treating symptoms or managing symptoms, but it's not actually um, reversing or or curing the physiologic changes, you know, that Dr. Friedman had talked about. So I think the new way of thinking about lymphedema is hopefully from a impairment-based model where we look at patients' subjective signs and symptoms. We already see this falling on physical exam. And then at a certain point, if not treated with complete, complete decongestive therapy, the changes can become irreversible. Um, so I'm hoping that we can change our paradigm to now look at this as a preventive perspective screening model. So now we are looking at high-risk patients um, that we've already touched upon after surgery, but probably also before surgery, if they're going to be receiving a cancer intervention or radi radiation intervention that is going to predispose them to a higher chance of developing lymphedema. Um, I'll talk a little bit about better diagnostic technology. And then, of course, hitting home that early referrals and early intervention is really key here. So why are we focusing on prevention? Of course, um, it's not just injury. That's not the whole picture. So we kind of think of the lymph system as an organ system. It's kind of like organ system failure. And in all of the organs below um, that leads to failure, prevention is, of course, much, much easier than treatment. And so the hallmarks of any pathophysiological disease are infl inflammation, fibrosis, and some changes even before clinical signs of lymphedema are, are apparent. Um, we talked about this a little bit, identifying high-risk patients, um, making sure that we have a baseline. Patients should really see a therapist before they even have surgery to make sure that we have a baseline measurement. Um, talk about a prospective screening plan, what we already went through, and then diagnostics. And then there, of course, are so many non-surgical options. Um, and I mentioned diagnostic workup because we touched on this a little bit at the very beginning, but there's also a lot of mimickers of lymphedema. So there are people who have venous stasis or lipedema or... Um, sometimes other, other sorts of cancer. Um, and we want to make sure that everyone is kind of shunted into the appropriate workup and treatment plans. And then surgical candidates that come to us and how do we how do we approach that? So diagnostics. It is really important to have a consistent system. And so we talked about a little bit about extremity volume and measurements, picking up any sort of um, getting into the yellow and LDEC stores and making sure that we're picking up patients that may need to be referred appropriately. Um, ICG is the most common that I use and that a lot of surgeons are using to diagnose um, the physiology of the lymphatic channels and the anatomy. And then some people do get MRIs, MRAs, MRVs, and then something called lymphocytography. And of course, what's really important is making sure that we're following patient reported outcomes measures, because that's really the research that is telling us what's working and what's not working. So a little about ICG. So this is called, it's, it stands for Indocyanin Green Laser Lymphangiography. We can use it in the operating room. We also use it in the office as a diagnostic measure. So initially this was used, people may hear it because when you have a sentinel lymph node, and I'm going to mostly refer to patients with breast cancer or pelvic node cancer um, that develop extremity lymph, uh, lymphedema, but usually this was used to map out sentinel lymph nodes. But we actually now use this to do something called reverse mapping. And so we can actually look at all the channels in an extremity and see how the lymph is draining. Um, and this can this is really useful because we can see this in real time. So I can inject someone in the office and actually watch the lymph flow in real time rather than something like a lymphocentigraphy, which requires a nuclear injection uh, and is I think a little scarier. <laughs> <laughs> so a little bit about how the lymphatic pathways work. We talked about this a tiny bit before, but um, I inject in three places. So one here in the in the wrist. Don't worry, local anesthetic first because this does sting. But after the local anesthetic, a little bit in the wrist. Um, usually this pathway comes all the way up the arm, passes the elbow, and goes towards the armpit in the inner side of the arm. There's one in the first web space as well. And this also... You'll see most of these pathways tend to go down into the inner part of your elbow and then down into the armpit. And the same thing in the third web space. So this is, again, everything kind of comes, there's three main pathways in the form that we want to see, and then they all kind of converge and get into the armpit in different, different locations. Here's an example of, of an ICG in the office. Okay, so here's normals after injection, the lights are turned off. 
then you can see the fluorescence and all these linear channels. And if I had gone a little slowly, you would actually see the lymph moving. This is the abnormal arm. So you can already see the silhouette is a little bit bigger. There's some patchiness. And this person does have some channels that you can see. They're coming up the arm. The elbow is up here. Apologize for my shakiness in the camera. Let's see if I can speed it up a little. Okay, and then they stop, right? So this is the elbows around here and they're stopping just above the elbow. So if I go back to normal, you can see hand, wrist, linear channels, those three main channels we talked about in the forearm. They're all kind of converging up, going into the inner arm and the armpit. And the, the one that is abnormal is kind of just stopping, okay? And so here's another um, schematic. So you can see arm, this is normal, nice linear channels, bright spots where the nodes are. And this is what we call dermal backflow, where the fluid is just kind of building up in the superficial skin. Um, and you can see a lot of lymph is collecting. So the nice part of ICG is, of course, we can see, we can stage people, see how severe the lymphedema or the grading scale is. And this really guides me on what can we do for surgery, depending on how the lymphatic anatomy looks. Um, it's kind of nice because you can also see, so patients are also looking at the screen and we can talk in real time about the channels, where they are, uh, and what we can do about this. And then advantages for high-risk patients, actually we're talking about now, is that we don't have to do this just to diagnose someone who already has clinically apparent lymphedema. We could actually do this on a yearly basis for people who don't see lymphedema. We can actually see if their lymphatic channels or the anatomy is, is changing. And so we can pick this up before you even, even see or, or feel swelling. Um, additional workup that we, we might get is an MR or a magnetic resonance. So this is angiography, meaning we're putting dye into the arteries and veins, or MRL, which is a little bit harder to do. You can actually put the dye into the lymphatic vessels. Um, the advantage of this is you can see deeper. So the ICG only penetrates skin deep. So it's only those superficial lymphatics. And if you want to see something much, much deeper, looking at the lymph node basins, this is a much more comprehensive image. The nice thing about this too is we can look at, is the affected limb mostly fat dominant? Is it mostly fluid dominant? Um, what does the blood flow look like? And is there anything else, you know, just in case if there's any masses or lumps, we can also pick that up on, on MRA or MRL. Venography is a little bit um, less utilized in the lymphocentigraphy. Also, you can see in here, this picture is a, is a nuclear scan. So we can see the lymph node basin. So let's say we're um, putting this into someone's ankle. We want to see the, if the lymph nodes are functioning, not just in the groin, but they are also functioning in the um, popliteal fossa or for the arm, are the lymph node basins patent in the elbow as well as the armpit. And that can guide surgical decision-making. This is really hard to see. It's small, but I'm going to blow it up. So kind of an algorithm now that we're following is patients were referred to us who have symptomatic lymphedema, upper extremity or lower extremity. First, we actually filter by, by BMI, body mass index, because a significant portion of decreasing symptomatic lymphedema is losing weight. And so anyone who has a BMI of over 30, we actually usually say, okay, we're going to send you for exercise, diet, nutrition, and bariatics, and control everything that we can with weight first, because most likely surgery is not going to be able to address this until those factors are controlled. Um, after that, control BMI, and then we say, okay, um, have you completely exhausted compression therapy? So we want to make sure that you're in rehab compression and complete decongestive therapy for at least six months. Then we look at you clinically and say, okay, um, if you're in 24 seven compression, you've tried everything else. Is there any pitting or no pitting? If there's no pitting, it's probably fat dominant. We can confirm this with MR. Um, but if you're, if you have a fat dominant type of lymphedema, then most likely if we're going to perform surgery, it's going to be some sort of liposuction. So if remove the volume, um, if there is pitting, then it's either fluid dominant or you may have some component of fat. And again, MR and geo can help with that uh, if it's not clinically obvious. But at that point, because there's fluid, we do the ICG mapping. And when we're looking at lymphatics, obviously that nice linear channel is normal. Um, if there is a linear channel, but they're just, the lymphatics just kind of stop. So in that, in that um, video that we had seen, there were channels, there was some dermal backflow, but there's also some channels that just kind of stop at the elbow or stop right above the elbow. Then we know that there are channels, there are probably some veins around there, and then we can actually just bypass the lymphatic system and direct that lymph directly into veins that are in the same, same spot. 
Otherwise, if you see someone with just total dermal backflow, meaning there's no lymphatic channels that I can see on the ICG, then we may need to pursue something called a vascularized lymph node transfer, where we actually transplant or auto-transplant lymph nodes from somewhere else in the body into the affected area. So any non-surgical candidates, don't worry, we're going to refer you, support you, quarterback you. You should still have long-term follow-up and make sure that we really um, address everything that could be leading to worsening of your lymphedema and correct that first. But the surgical options, I had the algorithm. Sometimes we call this lymphedema ladder, which could be a little easier to see. So just to reiterate, because it's a lot of information, um, starting from the very beginning of your journey. So lympha is now called ILR, or immediate lymphatic reconstruction. This is done before anything has happened that could predispose you to lymphedema. So this is before an axillary lymph node dissection, before radiation, before any sort of iatrogenic injury. It's prophylactic surgery. Um, LVA or B, it's a lymph and venous anastomosis or bypass where you have the channels that end and we can redirect you into veins. Um, lymph node transplant or transfer is where we take the nodes from somewhere else. Then there's, of course, the fat dominant liposuction. And then the very, very end of the ladder, which really we don't, we don't offer until you're extremely end stage. It's something called a Charles procedure, which I won't even go through. Um, but basically, we just remove all the affected tissue. All right, so some examples. So starting at the very beginning, immediate lymphatic reconstruction. So this is usually, and again, I'm, I'm talking in terms of breast cancer, but we can talk about anything that is removing nodes, um, axillary or pelvic dissection. So at the time that these nodes are removed, you can think about it as, of course, we talked about some of the anatomy of the lymphatic pathway really well done by Dr. Friedman. Um, but when we have breast cancer and the cancer is spreading into lymph nodes, people who have to have an X-ray dissection, when we are removing those nodes, it is difficult to see um, which nodes are draining the breast and which nodes are draining the arm. And sometimes you have to take the ones that are draining both the, the breast and the arm. And so the breast surgeon will map using usually two different things. So they can use blue dye and they can use a radioactive tracer called technetium 99. They map the nodes that are draining the breast and they're preferentially taking those. I, at the same time, will inject a different dye called fluorescein into the arm. And I use a microscope with a special filter so I can see that. Um, and I can see the channels that are draining into the nodes. When the nodes are removed, then I can still see the channels kind of leaking into the armpit. And at that point, instead of having the nodes are gone and the lymph has nowhere to go, um, instead of just clipping them and letting them seal off, we find a vein nearby um, and we can redirect these lymphatic channels into the vein. And so you can see this in the schematic on the right, where all these lymph nodes, hopefully everyone can see, all these lymph nodes, there's little clips here on the channels. And then I find those little yellow channels and then I redirect them into these veins. They are very, very small. So here's a little, little demonstration of the dye. I actually inject three dyes. Fluorescein is the yellow one. I inject my own blue dye. Um, and then I also inject the ICG because I want to get a baseline in the operating room of what your lymphatic channels look like. So after surgery, you will wake up and have a, bu a bunch of colors on your arm, but don't worry, it all goes away within a week. Um, and here is just a little diagram of this is the chest wall, this is the arm. When we do an axillary dissection, the landmarks we're already looking at is um, one of your, your chest muscle, your back muscle down here, and then your big artery and vein, your axillary vessels here. Off of those big vessels, there are a lot of veins that come off. So some patients sometimes ask, you know, oh, you're, you're sacrificing a vein to put lymphatic channels into. Is that okay? It's definitely okay. There's tons and tons of veins in there. And then all of these veins have tons of little branches off of that. And so this is what the anastomosis looks like. This is a, a lymphatic channel going into vein. This background is, this is under the microscope. So each box is one millimeter. So this vessel is probably 0.8 millimeters that we're doing. Okay, so let's say that you have already had your axillary dissection and you might you are developing lymphedema, you've gone through all of your conservative measures and you're interested in seeing, you know, is there anything else I can do to increase my quality of life? So um, this is a delayed treatment. It's called a lymphatic bypass. And so this is where the channels are, you have linear channels, but they're stopping. And so I can find where the channels have stopped using ICG and then map, find a vein next to it, and then redirect along the extremity, little cuts, two centimeter cuts, just in the skin, and then redirect each of those small lymphatics into very, very tiny veins. As you can see that here, cuts along the arm, the vein goes either end to end, meaning um, side, like a, you cut it open and then just 
nest most the whole entire thing into a vein or if the vein is too big then we go into side meaning that the vein is actually not disrupted we just make a tiny hole in it and also add the lymphatic fluid into there and so we do this under a microscope you can see this is a this is it looks big this is probably a one centimeter incision um and then here's two tiny little veins here's the lymphatic vessel we inject the dyes again here's one going into side and here's a little schematic then again one more end to side and again these this is all one millimeter boxes. Now, let's say you don't have linear, in linear channels. Everything's kind of dermal black flow, and we have to replace the lymph node basin. So this is where we have no patent lymphatic channels. We will take a vascularized lymph node transplant. And there's a bunch of places you can take this from the body. Um, and this is a really nice diagram of that. So there is supraclavicular, submental. There's actually nodes adjacent to the sternum. There's nodes in the belly, and there's nodes in the groin. Of course, the, the biggest thing is that we don't want to sacrifice lymph nodes from somewhere else and cause lymphedema there, right? Like the worst thing that we want to do is take nodes from your groin and then you get lower extremity lymphedema while we're trying to treat your upper extremity lymphedema. So um, now we, we will actually, if we are going to do, take nodes from somewhere else, we'll reverse map that extremity to avoid creating donor say lymphedema. Um, and I think a lot of people around the country now are using something called Omentum. And that is a huge lymph node basin that resides in your abdomen. So yes, I do I do have a general surgeon come and help. So we can do this minimally invasively through cameras, laparoscopically or, or robotically. Um, but you can't really create lymphedema inside your belly. So this is like your gold standard of, of lymphatic treatment that you can harvest a bunch of really healthy nodes, small, um, and, and hide it so that you don't have some weird skin paddle or, or bulkiness inside your armpit. Um, so, so that's, that's it. So we would like to transition to obviously a preventative prospective screening model. And it's a really a multidisciplinary approach that we want to undertake high risk surveillance, we want better diagnostic technology for early detection, early referrals and early intervention. I welcome any questions. Thank you. That was, I'm always amazed to watch all of the inside stuff. <laughs> um, so we do have some questions. Um, let's see. So we can, did you address the can lymphedema be cured question? I wish. I do tell people that we're working on it. Um, and yeah. most people, and I'm sure the biggest question is like, does anything you talked about actually work? <laughs> yeah. That's the number one question I get, of course. Um, so number one, if you are having immediate lymphatic reconstruction, which means you have not had your x-ray dissection yet, it is up to 30% if you have an axe dissection that you will develop some sort of lymphedema. Now the prospective trials are finally giving preliminary data and we now have decreased that to about 10%. So it is a significant decrease, it's not zero. And I'm hoping that with better technology, um, I mentioned that you know, one of my interests is robotic microsurgery. These are very tiny vessels. Um, it is technically difficult to put them together. And if we can have better visualization, increase the amount of channels we can put back together um, and do it really well, then I'm hoping that that rate can decrease even further. And then for the delayed procedures like bypasses or transplants, um, we first tried to look at an outcome of limb volume, but that is hard because as you very well know, this could be affected by a bug bite, cellulitis, the amount of salt you eat, the time of day. Um, and so it's really difficult to track that over time. And so now we're focusing on quality of life and quality of life can be, um, do I decrease the amount of cellulitis episodes I have? Or do I do my, my clothes or my rings fit better overall? Um, can I get out of 24 seven compression? You know, those are, can I stand for longer? Can I, can I use my arms for longer? And those are quality of life outcomes that do get better, which is great. Great. Um, so we have another question. I had one lymph node removed with breast cancer surgery. Um, I was told that to prevent lymphedema, I should never have blood drawn or my blood pressure taken on the affected side arm. Is this true, Dr. Friedman? Um, so as I mentioned, really the controllable things in your life are are your weight and hot tubs. There have been now very extensive studies, many of them done in Australia by a researcher who is really um, fixed on, on doing studies where they follow 
thousands of people at risk for lymphedema and a blood test and a blood pressure measurement do not cause lymphedema. If you think back to the picture of the lymphatic system, those lymph vessels are totally separate from your veins. A venipuncture is making a hole in your vein and taking out some blood. That's not going to change the structure of your lymph system. Wrapping the tourniquet around for a brief period of time is not going to damage or rupture any of those lymphatic pathways. So blood tests are absolutely fine. Um, blood pressure, likewise, um, if you have lymphedema in the arm that's relatively large, I usually recommend use the other arm because you might not get an accurate blood pressure reading because you have a lot of fluid in the tissue that you have to squeeze in order to finally get the blood pressure. But again, that blood pressure cuff is not going to cause lymphedema. It can't change your anatomy. So use whatever vein is best on either arm. Uh, so our, let's see, we had another question earlier, um, how to prevent oozing sores on swollen limbs? Um, how did the sores happen? What's prevention and care? What are the dangers and concerns? Um, so I think I can hit on that as far as the treatment aspect of it. Sometimes when, um, when you have a swollen limb that you're stretching out the skin and the tissues underneath it and they become very fragile. And as that limb swells, when your body is full of fluid, um, sometimes even just the smallest breakdown in the skin or just the fragility of the skin will cause that fluid to leak out because it has no, no place to go. Um, so it's almost, we, we call it in the clinic, a drippy leaky faucet. Um, and it could be multiple spots on the limb. Sometimes if you have a small open wound, it can just drip. And we'll see patients come in with, I mean, it, it looks like they wet the bed. I mean, it's a large spot and you just see this little drip, 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 but it's constant drip. So one of the ways to help with that is to decongest the limb as much as possible. And really depending on what the medical background is of the patient, that can sometimes be easier than other times. Um, so if you have somebody who has metastatic disease, it, we might then rely on um, medications to help decrease some of that fluid volume systemically in the body. Um, but usually multi-layered bandaging, we will do that in a palliative way to help alleviate some of that um, the weeping and the oozing in the skin, depending on where it is, um, underneath those bandages, we'll actually put absorbent pads. Um, you know, we'll use um, opened maxi pads and put them on. So that helps absorb in between decongestive sessions. Um, you know, we're, when we decongest a limb, we're pushing fluid out of the limb and back into centrally into the venous and the circulatory and cardiac system. So we have to be careful that we balance and that the body can absorb that fluid that we're pushing back into the system. So um, sometimes it's better that it's leaking out of the limb and not being stuck in the body. Um, so it's, it's a tough question to answer, but um, there are some ways that we can help to um, decrease it a little bit. Um, so let me get to, uh, I had a mastectomy of the left breast with lymph node removal. I don't have any visual signs of swelling. However, I have a lot of discomfort in my arm, armpit and shoulder. How can I address this with my therapist who repeatedly says I'm doing well and I'm not? It saddens me because based on what I've heard tonight, I'm concluding I've not received effective treatment. Um, I would have moved on, but getting lymphedema treatment in my area is a treatment rarely even offered. Um, so if you don't have any visible signs of swelling, some of that discomfort in the arm and the armpit and the shoulder um, may be more myofascial than lymphedema related. Um, you know, there could be some scar tissue. Um, if you've had reconstruction or not reconstruction, we see a lot of patients in our clinic with decreased range of motion and just physical dysfunction in that upper extremity. So um, from a therapist perspective, you may need more manual therapy and really myofascial release or um, range of motion stretching exercises. There are some modalities out there that we can use to help soften some of that scar tissue and alleviate some of that myofascial. Um, you know, it's not uncommon um, to have 
these symptoms. They're very common in the clinic um, and we, we should be able to address them. So how can you address it? Um, you just keep saying you have it, <laughs> you know, I mean, you can suggest that there are some other things to do or potentially switch. You don't need lymphedema treatment for myofascial release. You need a, a therapist who's trained in myofascial release, um, who's familiar with somebody who's had a mastectomy or if you've had reconstruction. Um, you know, that's not something that's taught in general PT schools, but you can find a specialist who, who may be familiar with. It's normally, typically you'll find lymphedema therapists are the ones doing this treatment because we tend to be seeing all the breast cancer related lymphedemas um, as well and then treating all the other side effects from cancer treatments. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a lymphedema therapist that you see. So I hope that answers your question. Um, let's see, I had one over here. Um, is your care also offered at Bridgeport Hospital or Park Avenue? Yes. Um, we have lymphedema therapists across the Yale New Haven Health System Network. Um, and we'll put up our contact information at the end. Feel free to reach out to me and I can help direct you at therapist, therapy that's closer to you um, around Connecticut and even closer in New York too. Um, how can I get a consultation with Dr. Ayala? <laughs> Uh, you can call my office. <laughs> we'll put, um, let's see. What, what's your, I'm going to put it right here. What's your, um, whoops. Oh, darn. I'll put it in the chat box. What's your office yeah, number? I can put it in there too. Yeah. Throw it that in. Is... Okay. Yeah, um, I'll throw it in the chat. Are there resources available to help find a licensed lymphedema therapist? There are. Um, if you rewatch the, um, the video will um, we'll send out a link tomorrow of this webinar at the end. Um, there are a few websites that you can go to um, to find licensed lymphedema therapists. The schools that train lymphedema therapists have the database of therapists across the country. Um, so you just type in your zip code and it'll tell you who they are. Um, again, you can always feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to help navigate that for you. Um, let's see. And I'm going to say we did that one. So I was diagnosed in 2011. There's been so much progress with lymphedema treatment since then. I was never told not to use hot tubs, which I did, only not to lift heavy weights. There was no information at all in the patient notebook given during breast cancer treatment about lymphedema. Um, and again, I think that is um, pretty common in 2011, which was, 13 years ago, there, there was a lot less lymphedema treatment, um, a lot less, not as much known about lymphedema back then. Um, so we were in an area where we're just, we've always, we've had a very um, strong lymphedema program for years that Dr. Friedman started um, in our area. And we've just been overly passionate about it for all of these years. So. That's not uncommon. If you have lymphedema, it's never too late to get treatment for lymphedema. Um, you know, we can, we've treated patients 20, 30 years out. Um, we can always make a difference. Um, let's see. Uh, this was incredibly helpful and detailed. I had DCIS in 2019. I had Lymph nodes removed during lumpectomy and reconstructive surgery. I went to physical therapy a month later because I couldn't put my arm up. After I started radiation, and it was shortly after that I started feeling it, I kept telling the radiologist, and she pretty much said it was all in my head. I wish the preventative plan was in place then. My oncologist told me it was the dirty secret of radiation. So um, I was actually watching a, a lecture today and um, the real um, evidence, the evidence that's out there, you know, when you when we look at axillary, what, when we look at your risk, um, what they were saying is that, you know, the, having the lymph nodes removed is the largest culprit. Um, when you add radiation to it, 
yes, that adds a little bit more to your risk, but not dramatically a lot. Really, we, we are looking at that lymph node removal. So over time, what we'll see is um, we'll move away from those large axillary node dissections. And as we're getting better in cancer treatments, moving into just the sentinel node biopsies, which is what's going to dramatically reduce your risk um, of getting it. But there's always that small percentage, unfortunately, who may have had a sentinel node biopsy or, um, you know, there is that whole level of primary lymphedema. Um, we have pediatric patients, children who are born with lymphedema, people who develop lymphedema at some point in their life and they've never had surgery or any kind of cancer. Um, so there are things that change or can change or be affected during in utero, when we're, our lymphatic system is developing, that can affect it. So sometimes it's anatomy, like Dr. Friedman and Dr. Ayala had said earlier. Um, so it's really hard to say um, what caused the lymphedema when it happens. I'll just pitch in a little. For, so even though our topic is lymphedema, radiation does cause a host of other problems, mostly um, or what we see and treat in the soft tissue area. So the person who had pain, loss of range of motion of the shoulder, stiffness, tightness, those things can be radiation caused. We can treat them um, in addition to or separate from lymphedema treatment. So um, radiation effects are very real. Some may recover over time, but I always urge patients who have shoulder issues or, or armpit issues after radiation to have treatment because shoulders love to tighten over time. They never get looser on their own. They just really have to be moved and, and treated. So if you have radiation side effects affecting your, your soft tissue, that's something that needs to be addressed also. Doesn't need a lymphedema radio, um, therapist, as Heather said, but needs a therapist who's experienced in treating it. Um, okay, sorry. Um, so we have, um, are there plans to hire more lymphedema therapists at Smilo? There are plans, there are lots of plans to help. Um, <laughs> There are lots of plans. <laughs> there are a lot of, I think there's a lot of comments about, um, yeah, of course we have a, we have a very large health system. Greenwich is wonderful. Obviously you have Heather, which is like the best, you're like the best person in the whole world. And I wish I could send everyone to you, but, no. um, but you know, the difference is, <laughs> and I think what we've learned over the years is, um, you know, we're, we are trying to standardize care for lymphedema as is the world. And this is, you know, this varying degree of therapy happens all over the country. Um, it mostly started because of um, reimbursement and insurance. Um, you know, as therapists, years ago, we would say, okay, you can come five days a week for, for four weeks. And the insurance company said, okay, and they paid for it. And then over time, there became more restrictions in insurance. And so if you, if you didn't fight the insurance companies, um, sometimes the facilities that you're at, or depending on where you are, it's, it's you're only given two visits a week and that's what the insurance companies were giving or there is only a therapist a hundred miles away and the only time you can go is two times a week so um, we're aware of this and this is just something that's happened over time mostly as a result of time management and reimbursement rates unfortunately um, but with with a little bit of work we're trying to turn it back all around again because we realize that people aren't getting um, the same results as when they are being treated um, with more effective therapy. Yeah, I can't overstate how much therapy is the champion of lymphedema. And all of you are correct. You know, we do need to hire, we would never have enough lymphedema have therapists enough. <laughs> in the Connecticut area, you know, and um, we do have a couple of excellent ones. I know that they are. Yeah. There is a backlog to reach them and we are working on that. There's actually a lot of behind the scenes work. We have a meeting every Monday <laughs> about how to improve this pathway and this process. And to, of course, we're creating this entire um, entire pathway of, of screening patients, getting them to the treatment and then developing like a high risk surveillance clinic. And so with that, we actually have hired two additional surgeons. So you are welcome to see me, but you can also see my partners, um, Dr. Haykal 
just started. Um, she's not new to plastic surgery. She's certainly not new to lymphedema, but she is new to Yale. And I'm so happy that she's here. And then we have another surgeon coming in and starting in the fall. So with three surgeons, we also need, um, yes. we, for three surgeons, we need like hundreds of the times of, of therapists, you know, because we only see a certain subset of patients who are candidates for surgery. And I'm hoping that while we build this lymphatic center of surgical excellence, we can also build a huge network wide <laughs> lymphedema therapy that is the plan yes exactly um so just a quick question about um lymphedema is primarily in my trunk so i guess it would be considered breast lymphedema nope we would still consider it truncal lymphedema i mean it's you know caught but we would treat it the same way we would find garments the same way sometimes with um, patients who have breast lymphedema or trunk lymphedema we utilize um, kinesio tape we utilize compression there's lots of um tools and tricks out there um, for that. So, but we do see it compression. Um, there was another question about the part of the body behind the arm that is mostly what swells up. We see that a lot after lumpectomies and radiation or reconstructive surgery after breast cancer. It's that chunk behind the arm right here and underneath here, a little pouch that fills up with fluid. Um, and we do have ways to help decongest that. Sometimes it's just anatomically what happens after surgery and it's where it pulls, but um, compression garments and doing self manual lymphatic drainage can help with that also. Um, let's see, I understand blood draws don't cause lymphedema, but if I already have it, can I have blood drawn in that arm? So this is my territory, right? Yes, uh, yes you can if your veins are accessible, findable, um, puncturable, you certainly can have blood drawn from that arm. Um, some people are worried that the actual breaking of the skin is a possible source of cellulitis. Um, that's really extraordinarily rare. Your skin is cleansed with alcohol beforehand and the, the needle of a vena puncture is sterile. It's a quick, clean break. Cellulitis will often be a little more common with what I call dirty wounds, like your cat scratching you or your rose bush scratching you. So um, that is really a, a minutia kind of, of problem. So again, you wanna get your vena puncture you know, from your good veins. And if your good veins are in your arm with lymphedema and the venipuncturist can easily find them, there really isn't a lymphedema reason not to do that. It won't affect your lymphatic system. Um, great, I know we're, we're wrapping it up. Um, oh yeah, the back crease, I did get that one. And we will be emailing out the link to rewatch um, this tonight if you want. I'm. Happy to share my slides as well. I just put in the chat, we've got Dr. Ayala's contact information. Dr. Friedman and I work together. So feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to help find care in your area. Um, talk through anything. And we also have our cancer answers at yale.edu for general questions um, as well that will get redirected. So. Um, with that, I would just like to thank everyone for joining us tonight, for hanging in there and staying on so long, and to um, my two co-presenters who I'm honored um, to be with tonight. And I hope everybody has a great rest of your evening and great rest of the week. Thanks so much.